Hey, everybody. Good evening. Good evening, Christian. Good evening, Matt. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I think we're still waiting for a few uh, trustees to join us, and then we should be all set. Matt, I think that all of the trustees are here except perhaps for Sarah. That looks correct. That looks what I'm seeing. Uh, okay. All right. Well, I think we will. Ah, there's Sarah. All right. I don't well, see Colleen Burns. I see her. Okay. Yes, I think we, uh, everyone, I'm seeing everyone on on board. So uh, will the secret, I will call the meeting to order. And will the secretary call the roll, please? Unmuting. All right. Colleen Burns. Here. Marianne Monraj. Here. Christian Harris. Here. Virginia Bloomshire. Here. Ted Foss. Ted. I see you. You gotta unmute yourself. Okay, here. Matt Fruth. Here. And Sarah Glavin is also present. I was wrong, right? Excellent. Thank you, everyone. Um, we will move on to approval of the minutes from our May 19th meeting. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Seconded. I think it was Marianne, then, then Sarah. So um, we have them. If there's, is there any corrections or comments regarding them? I'm seeing no hands go up or attempts to speak through mutes. So we will. Will the secretary call the roll to? Yay or uh, approve the minutes, yay or nay. Colleen Burns. Yay. Mary Ann Monraj. Yay. Christian Harris. Yay. Virginia Bloomshire. Yay. 
Ted Foss. Yes. Matt Fruth. Yay. Sarah Glavin, yay. The minutes are approved. We'll move on to uh, community member and visitor comments. Uh, in terms of public comments from the community, I received no comments in advance of tonight's meeting. David, did you receive anything? No, I have not received any, Matt. Okay. Then we will proceed to uh, the Megan Traficano, the Youth Services Director from the Oak Park Township. Welcome, Megan. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for having me here. Um, I'm just coming to speak about the Youth Interventionist uh, Intergovernmental Agreement. So there has been a couple of changes to the agreement that I wanted to make sure everyone is aware of. And then I also wanted to make sure that um, I answered any questions or any concerns that anyone may have. Uh, first of all, uh, the funding structure of the agreement has changed. It is still a two-year agreement. However, instead of each uh, taxing body taking on a percentage of the overall interventionist budget, what I did is I looked back at the past five years, I looked at back at the, um, the intergovernmental agreements had a do not exceed amount, and then really what each governing body was actually paying into the program. And I took what the average was for each governing body. Um, so that's the biggest change to the funding structure. It's just gonna be um, just one set amount broken up into equal quarterly payments instead of waiting for a percentage of what was what the budget is. And you'll see too in the agreement that there is, a, there is you get to see the actual budget um, from my budget document, what we budgeted for the program. The township is taking over the responsibility of both the River Forest, the Village of River Forest and the Village of Oak Park pulling out of the agreement. So we're not asking any other taxing body to um, fund that amount. And then also I did, we did receive a $5,000 grant from the Helen Brock Foundation for the Interventionist Program for this year. And that's something that I will continue um, searching for grants and seeking out that outside funding. Um, I think the fact that we got this grant this year is a great start and hopefully this will help prove that we can get grants in the future. Um, otherwise, the agreement pretty much maintains the same. We did, however, add in telehealth and virtual appointments, virtual trainings, just with the current uh, climate that's going on with the COVID-19 pandemic. So that will be, you'll see that in the agreement as well. Um, but I think those are the big major changes. I don't know if anyone has any questions about our work or partnership collaboration with the library staff. I'm happy to answer anything at all. Um, we got a new database that went live December 1st, 2019. So we do have more data coming out as well, more transparency in the program. So I'm happy to answer any database questions too. Megan, this is David. Uh, Rob Simmons uh, is not able to be with us for tonight's meeting, but I was wondering if you might just comment a little bit on your collaboration with him and uh, some of our other colleagues here at the library uh, and how uh, you view that collaboration as benefiting both the interventionist program and uh, the services that we're able to provide. Oh, absolutely. Um, first of all, I have to say that myself and my staff are incredibly lucky to have Rob, uh, you know, just a couple doors down at the library. He's been um, a great resource for us. And I hope that in return, we've been a great resource for him. Uh, we mostly work with Rob and with Steven Jackson um, we, this spring, we started doing outreach twice a week at the library on their behalf. And what we did is we sent um, Dr. Raheem Young, who's a new interventionist, he was hired in January, and Dominique Hickman, who's also an interventionist, and they went, they did outreach to the teen population at the library. Um, and what they decided with Rob, with Steven, and with Darcel Washington was that they were going to run some groups for these teens after school. So Dominique and Darcel started a girls group and uh, Raheem and Darcel started a co-ed group and it was more geared towards life skills. And they were going great before the pandemic hit. And that's something that we're hoping to continue in the future. Also, um, Dominique Hickman is moving to a Girls on the Rise program. She runs it at District 97. Um, and it's a program that's targeted uh, for black and brown girls. Um, and it works on self-esteem, self-image, 
um, communication skills, life skills, self-advocacy. Um, we've talked with Rob and Steven about um, implementing this at the library in a library space for the high school population this upcoming school year after school. Um, also, I've worked with uh, Stephen on the Restorative Justice Conference, um, and then uh, Stephen and Rob, I just talked to them last week. Uh, they will be reaching out to Raheem and Dominique and see if they'd be willing to participate in any of the peace circles that they are going to conduct with the teen population. Um, and so hopefully that will get set soon, too. Thanks, Megan. Megan, this is uh, Christian. I, I think we've met before a couple yes. of times. Yes, hi, Christian. <laughs> um, one question I had is uh, how many um, how many students, kids do, does the program impact? And then also, um, since it is a two-year agreement, um, what are kind of some of the goals for the program over the next couple of years um, sure. as well? Sure. So um, I believe in my annual report for last fiscal year, we had about 90 separate um, clients. So that was 90 kids in one year that the program impacted. But that is just on the individual caseload. If I look back and count up all of the groups, um, that would be a different number. So, you know, for example, the groups that we did at the library, they would have different kids sometimes who would come each week. They would have a set group of kids who would come weekly, but they would also welcome anyone new who was coming in for one week or um, you know, just dropped in just to try to kind of make that space open for them. So I would say in average, we could hit, I would say in between, I would say 150 to 175 kids in a given year. Um, and that, that's something that I can definitely start keeping track of too. I know the interventionists were keeping track of kind of how many kids were attending each group. Uh, so that's something too that we can definitely just track that data going forward. Uh, Dominique Hickman for her Girls on the Rise group, it is more of a closed group. So she does have the same girls who come um, every time. So that those numbers, the Girls on the Rise program this year serviced about 40 to 50 girls. And that was just the middle school girls. They didn't service any high school girls this year. Um, but Dominique, that is now going to be her main role at the township. She's not going to be an interventionist anymore. She's still going to help out with community outreach as needed, but she is going to be running Girls on the Rise full time. So she will probably even hit, I would say, close to uh, in between 100 and 150 girls just by doing that program itself. Um, and then just goals going forward. Um, I think, you know, one of the biggest things that we're seeing with our youth right now is their ability to advocate for themselves. So really working on that push, getting the youth in our community to continue this, this, this advocacy that they're doing to really get out there and talk about their needs, what's working for them, what's not working for them, what they need from us adults in the community to make them successful. Um, so that would definitely be a goal. And that would be something that I would love to work with Rob and Steven on as well. Because I think sometimes we hit, which is great, we hit different populations of kids. So I think sometimes the kids that come into the library aren't necessarily the same kids that are on the interventionist caseload. So I think by us working it together, we can hit more of those youth um, and make sure that everyone's being heard and feels like they have a voice. Um, otherwise, I want to continue with this data. Um, we got the database you know, December 1st, 2019. So I'm really excited to actually, once December hits around this year, to have a full year's worth of data. I think it'll really show some of the progress our program has made. We're goal tracking with all of our individual clients right now. So showing who's meeting their goals. If they're not meeting their goals, why are they not meeting their goals? Um, I think that will help really drive kind of our interventions going forward. And then also when I came on, we started to kind of um, take a different look, a different approach before the interventionist program really was looking at kids who were very heavily gang involved. While we still do deal with those kids, we saw the needs of the youth at the time as more mental health needs. So I think to continue to conduct those needs assessments and really um, figuring out what is, what is needed. And right now we do see a lot of mental health needs um, with the COVID-19 crisis that's going on. Um, we saw a, lot, a big spike in anxiety and depression among our youth. And so just really honing in on those and making sure that we have the staff in place to help deal with that. Thank you. Any other trustees have any questions for Megan? I'm 
I'm uh, just very, very happy to hear of the close collaboration between the library and the youth intervention people. I, I know it, uh, a year ago, I did express some concern that this was kind of an outside entity and why were we funding it? But I think that Megan, you've made it very clear that indeed this is a collaboration. Thank you, we feel that way. All right, anyone else? Colleen, Marianne, Sarah? The, the good work. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Virginia? Nope, just really happy to hear that there's some, you know, real markers for next year and I'm excited to see the, the girls group expand to the high school kids. Excellent. All right, then thank you, Megan. Uh, we were going to move on with our agenda and uh, I appreciate your time tonight. Thank you for having me. Have a nice night, everyone. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Moving on to trustee comments and board calendar. Um, I have a, just a Marianne. question. Matt, um, at what point in the agenda, sort of like for the year, will we start picking up the facilities planning um, questions again? Do we have a sense of that? I know everything is thrown all out of whack, but you know, we, we, I've, I've lost track of sort of calendar wise when sure. we're likely to start looking at that again. Well, I don't see a reason why we can't um, start putting that back on our agenda for next month. Uh, we've kind of gotten a, a handle on meeting in this format and, mm -hmm. and I think we can start uh, getting back into some of those other questions, but, you know, bringing some of those tabled items back up now okay, that i don't mean to rush the process i just just yeah well i, I think it's thinking, also thinking ahead like as we make budget decisions it would help to start knowing what that's gonna look like so absolutely yeah we yeah we can't yeah we we do have to get back to uh yeah because i was thinking this just today about you know when are we going to start having uh discussions about the next year's budget right. you know it's coming up and we don't want to wait too yeah. long and i'll also, if there, you know, I saw that we had the kitchen construction, which is great that, you know, if we, if we have to have the library closed, you know, being able to do construction stuff in the least disruptive manner is at least some side benefit, right? So, um, so I, I think the facilities planning probably is going to not involve major construction, but even minor construction, maybe it will turn out to be better to do sooner rather than later. Um, so, you know, even if it's just like building some partitions or, you know, who knows what, but um, so, yeah. Sure. Any other, Sarah? Yeah, one. Um, so I know David, we've talked about this in the past. <laughs> this may be also a Jeremy question. As I think a lot of discussion around, you know, clearly the library is making a lot of forward progress around conversations on equity. The conversations that we initiated in the last few months around race, I think have been very informative as we start to think about policies and processes as we move through the year. One area that I'm spending a lot of time on personally, and I, I'd like to kind of challenge the leadership to walk through with us and maybe in a future meeting, either next month or the following month, have some dialogue with us in the areas where we have discretionary spending that is not tied to kind of known investment in, um, you know, materials for the library, for instance. So contracts associated to things like um, construction or catering uh, or, you know, cleaning services, and of what our bid process is like related to inclusion committing to potentially a statement around when certain types of investments and purchases being made by the library that we commit to a certain percentage of each RFP being a diverse business. Mm -hmm. I'd like to maybe take it a little step further and say black owned businesses um, in addition to diverse bids and not every category has incredible opportunity, but I think we have a unique position to say where there are services that we can make those decisions, that we be very thoughtful and specific about the steps we're taking. 
And one just came up on a personal note um, from my office. I was introduced to a gentleman who owns the only black owned uh, eye care insurance company in the country. And he has been incredibly successful and does the eye service program for Herman Miller and some other big corporations. And I'm advocating to put him into a bid process for our uh, programs for next year at United. So just want to kind of know more and, and kind of understand kind of the formality of the procurement process. I know we've talked about there not being an incredible amount of that in the budget, um, but I think every active step is an important one and, and we should, you know, be thoughtful about kind of having that discussion. But that's kind of what I'd like to put on the radar. Thanks, Sarah. I, yes, I think that's a great, uh, that's a great point. And I think that's uh, certainly uh, a part of uh, the larger conversations that we're going to be having as we continue to work our way through the anti-racism process with Rashida and the advisory group that she's putting together um, to look not only at how we, how we bid and procure, but uh, how we uh, have worked to develop all, a lot of our uh, policies and practices. Um, and you're right, uh, the, the numbers of, of bids that we put out uh, or uh, the procurement process that we have is, is very limited. There are, there are very few of those kinds of things that we do as, a, as an organization, certainly uh, as compared to other agencies like the village or the park district. Um, but uh, that certainly should be a part of, the, uh, of our review of all of the policies and practices that, uh, that we have that I know will be a part of that process. Um, and uh, we can certainly begin sooner than later, uh, perhaps as soon again as we start talking about the budget for next year. Um, thinking about that and uh, we can, uh, Jeremy and I can work to get uh, some examples of what uh, those kinds of uh, equity-based policies would, would look like and, uh, and use them to, uh, to talk about and to compare with the policies that we, that we currently have as well. Um, and I think uh, also that um, as we also think about both the, the budgeting process and the strategic planning process for next year, uh, whether you know, that also includes the broader conversation uh, or narrower, if you will, of uh, our, um, of our uh, um, conversations around what we're going to do about our physical spaces. Um, I think we can, uh, we can certainly uh, make that also a part of whatever strategic planning special meeting we, we schedule for this summer, um, just as I would very much like to uh, reserve a good deal of that time for the board to have another conversation with Rashida Graham Washington. And I know she would uh, very much like to make that a part of her work with us over the next coming months. All right, thank you, I appreciate it. I had, uh, this is, sorry, ahead, this is Virginia. Virginia, I had one question from a community member earlier this week, and David, I know I emailed you on it, um, but I just kind of wanted to put it out there and, and put it in everybody's head so that you know, maybe we can brainstorm some ideas or start folding some ideas into to other things that we're doing. Um, looking at making sure that we can provide internet access, um, even if the buildings are not completely open, uh, and then also looking at remote access to internet. Um, for areas of the city where people may not have um, Mom. access to internet or may not have Wi-Fi available um, so that these students can still go to school. I know Mom. actual, Mom. sorry, I know actual uh, laptops and things are not items that we can provide and those are meant to come from the schools. Um, but just looking at what our options are as far as providing uh, Wi-Fi or internet access outside of the buildings. Yes, uh, thank you, Virginia. Um, so you all did receive the, my response to Virginia's email a little earlier this month. And I do think that this conversation can, can take place uh, ongoing in a couple of different ways. I mean, I think there are certainly things that we can choose to do as a library organization to expand access to that kind of, of um, broadband or, or, or technology or, um, 
or the internet. Um, and I, as I said, I can, uh, I talk with uh, Elizabeth Marsalek and, and Marcin Turlick about uh, investigating what uh, the expenses would be, for instance, here at the main library, if we wanted to uh, extend more broadly our, uh, our wireless access beyond the building. Um, but as I said, I also think that that is, uh, that's an important community conversation about uh, conversation about community priorities. And, uh, and I would certainly welcome that conversation also taking place uh, among uh, some of you and, and your colleagues uh, in some of the uh, bodies that you meet with, including COG and, and iGov. Um, I've had some conversations, brief conversations with Kara Pavlicek at the Village of Oak Park about this. And um, I think that there, it's unclear to me whether uh, it would ever be uh, in the short term a priority for the village in this environment to try to uh, do what I know other communities uh, in the country have done, which is to, to basically create uh, internet access or establish it as a, as a public utility, as you will, in the community so that um, that access is available to anyone uh, when they're, when they're uh, in the, within the confines of the village. Um, but uh, I, I, at the same time, I do think that it's, it's a conversation that, that really should and needs to take place uh, and, and involve more than just the library. But again, in a, in a more narrow way, sure, there are, there are certainly things we could do. Um, there are, besides extending the, the wireless signal, there are, uh, there are resources we could put into uh, purchasing, acquiring more mobile hotspots that can, be, that can be checked out, that can be lent to community members for, for extended periods of time. I mentioned that there's a community group that uh, we're trying to or is trying to partner with us uh, if uh, some some private funds can be uh, acquired to to uh, to buy those kinds of uh, that kind of equipment, and you know I've already said that the library can can participate by by helping to order and and process and and set up and and distribute those kinds of things. So there there are a lot of different things we can do, and the conversation can take place in different ways. Um, but I I would certainly love to see that conversation happen in a broader way uh, in the village. And I think to do that, that would really require the participation of uh, not only people like me and my colleagues in the other agencies, but of elected officials as well, um, in order to, to sort of elevate that conversation uh, in a way that would, uh, that would get more uh, traction or attention or uh, in ways that it might become a greater priority. I did, um, I, I did respond to David's uh, note to you, Virginia, uh, that I've, a couple of months ago, I became acquainted with one of the managers at the TCC Verizon store in River Forest. And they actually have given a grant to Housing Forward. And he personally, his name is Jack Wiggum. He, he's very much interested in the work that the library is doing with marginalized populations and how uh, Verizon could help with that. And so I think that he is an interesting person as we bring the wider conversation to the village to, to talk with somebody like that who is, is actually interested in these issues locally. Well, Virginia, uh, how, do you, how do you feel about that? Is, that? is this something you see the library needs to move forward on rather quickly? Or do you, do you feel that it's something we can wait and have a broader conversation over the next few months. Um, <clears throat> I'm just curious to get your thoughts on that. Um, I hate to say both, but both. Um, I don't see the library solving it being uh, a long-term solution. I don't think that that's something that we need to do. That being said, I think we have shown ourselves to be one of the more progressive and quick moving bodies uh, in the village, so it may be up to us to start steps toward a broader solution um, and and then see if we can we can broaden the participation to to some of the other governing bodies. I don't want to own this. Um, I, I don't don't want to own this uh, for the whole village. Um, 
but I also know that, you know, this is, these are the exact people, these are the exact students, this is the exact population that we all know needs our services and our attention the most, especially at a time like this where, you know, they've been asked to be the bright and wonderful students that we know that they are with even less capacity than they're, they're used to, to dealing with. So um, I think, Christian, to answer your question, it, it's going to be both. I would like to see what we're able to do in the short term, maybe see what we can do to help kids get through summer school with the idea of putting together something that's more comprehensive, working with the village and the school districts um, for, for the school year. And I'll, I'll echo, you know, this is, I think, something that has come up before. We've had community members asking whether it's possible for us to have laptops you can check out. Um, I know we already check out some hotspots, um, et cetera, but just speaking from dealing with my own students at UIC, we had massive tech challenges in the spring, just, just incredibly strong challenges. I had students that would have like a family of six, um, you know, where both adults were working and two of the four kids were in school and one was in college and they had one device to use between them. Um, I had a student who um, was, you know, joining our Zoom classes um, on a phone that had no video capability or, um, or even voice capability, he could just participate by typing essentially very slowly into the chat window, which was um, obviously really limited his, um, his options for participation in, in the class, and it was a real shame. So UIC kind of like eventually started rolling out more tech for the students, and um, you know, we'll see, I guess, what the schools are able to provide, but uh, I think, um, yeah, I feel like people forget. I also think people often don't, still don't know about the resources that are available. Like people are still surprised when I tell them how many of the parks have Wi-Fi. Um, so there's there's also sort of a communication thing happening that maybe we can do a better job of letting people know along with the park district, like letting people know what resources are available that the library does you know, have Wi-Fi hotspots that they can check out. I know, not to not to blame the communications department. I know this is an ongoing challenge, <laughs> so and will continue to be. But um, but it's kind of like a two-prong approach. And I do, you know, if it were up to me, and I've said this before, I I think we should seriously investigate the entire village, making approaching ComEd for village-wide Wi-Fi. And I think we would all save money in the long run. But in order to even start that process, I, I honestly think we would need a different village board than our current composition. So I don't think it's going to happen this year. Um, we'll see what happens next April, right? So. Well, I, I, I think if we if we move on this, if we try and look at some of this and what our options are, David, I think uh, reaching out to Dee Brennan would be uh, advisable. This converse, a similar conversation to this had come up during her tenure as our executive director and we had tried to convene uh, the park district. I'm sure Jan Arnold probably remembers this as well. The park, the, the park district, the schools and the village along a similar proposition of community wide Wi-Fi. Um, at least, or, you know, at least in the bit start of the business areas um, and the parks and we got, and we were the leaders on that at that time of trying to get this conversation started. And everybody said it sounded like a great idea, but no one wanted to put in the dollars, time, or effort to really pursue it. Um, so I, I think we should definitely try and have this conversation again. I think recent events with. Uh, the COVID breakout have really accentuated the needs um, for stuff like this, as well as an, an, just a general examination of our internet service systems and, you know, their age, their capacities, their, you know, a, a variety of issues. But I think for this, it, 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 it holds out 
it holds it holds up a light to a lot of issues around um, that people thought, well, we're Oak Park. Everyone should, everybody's everybody's got something. You know, you know there's no there's not a need for this. And I think it's we. Uh, hopefully, people have uh, are more open to the idea, the reality of of what what people actually have access to in our community. Thanks, Matt. I'm uh, yeah. I'd be happy to uh, communicate with Dee Brennan and and uh, talk with her about what she knows and remembers. That uh, from your description, it sounds like uh, these conversations pretty much go back to chapter one. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, I'm going to agree with Virginia. I would like to see some short-term options as well. Um, and uh, see, you know, see what we could potentially do uh, even this summer um, and uh, looking into the fall as well. Um, yeah, and I do think it definitely needs to be a larger conversation too and hopefully getting, uh, getting the village involved. It is interesting because also, like Mary mentioned, it is also an election year. So it could be something where if it's a conversation, it could be something where people are, are willing to get behind it um, while campaigning. So um, yeah, we can think strategically about that as well. Okay. Thank you. Anything else for trustee Commons? We have our board calendar in front of us. Matt, I, um, in talking with my colleagues again earlier this afternoon, it's my assumption, their assumption too, that before the end of the month, the governor is going to extend or renew his executive order that would permit public bodies to continue to meet in a virtual environment uh, pending a determination that you know that there is a uh, that there's a good and valid reason there's an emergency situation um, if he does not do that uh, if that order isn't extended then there's a possibility that the board might be required to meet in person in in the month of in the month of July but again right now we're expecting by before the end of June that that the executive order will be will be renewed but will pay attention to that and, and I'll certainly let you and the, and the rest of the board know what they might expect in July. And then you can tell me whether you want uh, at that point, if, if you're able to continue to meet virtually or if you wanted to try to meet in person. David, if the, if the order um, isn't extended and we're required to meet in July, is it given that, you know, we already have the option for people calling in, would it be possible that there would only be say three of the board members would be required to be there in person and we could set up a zoom screen for everyone else to attend the meeting or that that remains to be seen i mean under normal circumstances uh that would not be permitted but uh it, it just depends on what uh, what the governor de determines um I think that going forward, uh, just as I think our staff is beginning to consider that we're going to need to make or would want to make virtual uh, participation in lots of events and programs a, a, a regular feature, right. um, I think that we'll want to continue to make the ability for members of the community to, re to participate in these meetings remotely, even after the sure. board itself might continue to, or might resume meeting in person. Um, but uh, again, I'll have to, we'll have to wait until the end of the month and see exactly what the governor determines. And then I'll be able to tell you whether um, any of you would be able to continue to meet remotely or not. Okay, I'll, I'll just, you know, as someone who went through chemo and I was immunocompromised for like a year or so, I'm fine now, but I would be calling in. And so if any of the staff or board members are at risk, I think we should definitely work to make that an option if at all possible. Right. So. Right. And, and absolutely. And again, yeah. it's because of, of that and because uh, the governor has been so sensitive to those yeah. kinds of concerns that we're pretty sure. Probably he's it's fine. Yeah. Um, can I uh, just add one more calendar thing for the tomorrow, um, the next couple of days are the ALA virtual conference and 
uh, as is on the calendar. And for new board members, I know I'd recommended before attending if you can. Now that it's virtual, um, it may be even easier to attend for a bit. There's, um, I'm guessing there will again be a trustees session the way the, the way there was before. I learned a lot. I found it super interesting. So. I don't know what your work schedules are like, but if you have time in the next few days to attend, you may, um, even one or two sessions, you may find it really worthwhile. And the, the library will reimburse your registration, I think, whatever that registration cost is. That's correct. Uh, yeah. <laughs> There's no other comments uh, about the calendar. We will go ahead and move on to uh, David's executive report. Thank you. Um, as you know, uh, we uh, still have on our agenda for new business to take action on the intergovernmental agreement that Megan spoke to you about a few moments ago. I do want to spend a f just a few minutes uh, talking to you about our response plan for buildings and services. As you all know, we are currently, uh, according to the plan, in service level one. That means that our buildings remain closed. We continue to provide virtual and digital services. We have also begun a contact-free holds pickup here at the main library. That has been going uh, well for the past uh, week and uh, two days. And uh, on Monday, yesterday, we began uh, contact-free materials return. So people were uh, finally able to begin to return materials that they had checked out before our buildings closed last March 13th. So for now, that is the extent of our services in service level one. As uh, our state continues to move uh, in a pace that I consider rather quick to uh, now phase four of its reopening plans, uh, the leadership team spent a good deal of time earlier this afternoon considering what our response to that should be as we consider how we uh, want to continue working through our own plan. And uh, right now, our recommendation uh, is that the library plan to enter uh, service level two on Wednesday, July 15th. And if you, as you read through uh, our, our response plan, service level two uh, includes a, uh, a partial reopening of the main library. When I say partial, I mean uh, limited hours and certainly limited occupancy. And that uh, I don't have all of the specifics of that to share with you tonight, but will soon. Um, uh, the occupancy, of course, uh, we have a lot of uh, a lot of assistance from the Village of Oak Park in determining what maximum occupancy would be and based on our square footage. And we can make uh, determinations on our own what we what we think safe occupancy is for the main library. Um, all of our meeting spaces and study spaces would remain closed. There would continue to be no uh, group gathering or in-person programs or events at the library. We would permit, uh, again, within occupancy limits and physical distancing to allow patrons to browse shelves and to use technology, to use a computer for limited amounts of time. Uh, so that is essentially is what phase two, or I'm sorry, service level two for us would look like. We would, of course, continue all of the uh, virtual and digital programming. And we would also continue to encourage people who uh, don't need to physically visit the library for any reason to, if they want, continue using our contact-free materials pickup and contact-free materials return. The, the Mays branch 
and the Dole Branch would continue to remain closed completely under service level two because we uh, cannot manage the appropriate physical distancing in those smaller spaces. So I, I uh, mention that to you uh, so that you're informed uh, ahead of time uh, as we continue to work uh, now to prepare for that July 15th date, unless this evening you uh, have uh, strong feelings that we should be considering or doing something different, either something that is faster than that or something that is a little slower than that. Um, but right now, considering the, uh, the uh, plans of other agencies in the community to begin reopening physical spaces uh, and considering the state's plans, that is for now, for today, uh, our recommendation that, that service level two begin on Wednesday, July 15th. So now Matt, I'll stop talking and, and you guys can tell me what you think. David, um, somebody asked me today how long the books are going to be quarantined for, and I thought you told us, but I couldn't remember off the top of my head. That's a great question because we have just gotten some very po uh, positive preliminary information uh, from the Institute of Museum and Library Services about that. The, uh, the, the laboratory uh, and the organization OCLC that they're working with uh, just yesterday uh, announced that um, their preliminary studies demonstrate that the, the virus lives for a much shorter period of time on lots of common library physical materials than they thought. So up until this week, uh, most agencies, including our regional library system, were telling us that we should plan to quarantine materials for at least seven days once they were returned. Uh, and now with this new information, uh, we are only going to have to quarantine materials for three days. So that, that as of this week is what, uh, is what our plan is. So uh, yesterday, as I said, patrons began returning materials. They're doing that every day now. Those materials are being placed in boxes. Those boxes are being set aside. Uh, in, a, in an, in an uh, enclosed space here in the library. And after three days, now they'll be uh, handled by staff and, and put back into the collection to be recirculated. Okay, thank you. Does that help? Okay, great. I guess my other question is, um, well, I just, I just wanna make sure you all think you'll be in, I mean, I know you're confident in the recommendation, but I want to make sure you don't feel that you, know, you were sped up because of, you know, the governor's announcements or anything like that. Um, I had kind of changed my thoughts on the subject where, you know, my biggest concern really is that the staff is, is uh, safe and okay to come back to work. So I just want to make sure that you all have the time that you need and make sure, at least from my perspective, from, the, from my, the, uh, my perspective, I'm sure some of the other board members agree that, you know, we kind of have your back in that sense. If you well, could. Thank you. I know that that's wonderful to hear. I, I really appreciate that. Um, and um, I think most of the people in our community have been very understanding about the, the pace at which we've been, uh, at which we've been moving. Um, I think that, so first of all, um, most of our staff who can work remotely uh, are going to continue to work remotely. We're going to continue to give our staff uh, who aren't absolutely uh, necessary here in the building that option. Um, we're only going to have as many staff in the building as we need to provide the services that we're providing. Um, and uh, we are continuing to, to keep the health and well-being of our staff as the, as the first priority. So uh, we are not going to do, we, don't, we won't plan to do anything that we don't think we can do safely uh, or that we think is gonna jeopardize anyone's, uh, anyone's health. Uh, I think that um, we can safely proceed to service level two on July 15th uh, with, uh, with these uh, limitations that I've described in place. Uh, but uh, if uh, we, 
uh, if my staff, my leadership team, as they're spending these next coming days doing that and preparing, come back to me and tell me that they're, uh, that they're encountering some challenges or some new concerns, uh, then I'll, I'll immediately bring that back to all of you and you know, we may, may choose to make a, a different decision. Um, but right now, I think that uh, with, uh, with the restrictions and the limitations we're gonna continue, I think we can, I think we can safely proceed to July 15th for level two. Great, uh, thank you for that as well. And then I guess um, on the other side of that of that um, discussion is a thought I've been having where I'm a little, I guess, concerned or heightened or aware of the perception or the reality that it seems as though, you know, the people that who are gonna be in the building working are the probably more the hourly staff who are you know, the shelvers and the, you know, I'm, I'm not sure, but I'm sure it's probably, it's the senior management will probably more be at home or as opposed to, you know, the, um, the more the hourly staff will be the ones in the building working and, you know, on the front line. So I just want to make sure that, I, I don't know how to think about that equitably, but I want us to, that to be on the radar and for us to think about that as well. Thank you. No, I, I really appreciate that too. And we have, uh, been uh, talking and thinking very carefully about that. And we have so far, as I said, right now, we have, we, we really have very few of our staff in our building, but we have been very intentional about making sure that there are always members of uh, either our leadership or management team, uh, full-time staff managers in the building uh, with uh, our other staff members, um, and that we are not uh, either forcing, pressuring, or expecting uh, other staff, especially our part-time staff, uh, to do things that uh, they are either uncomfortable doing or unable to do, or that uh, other staff, including leadership and management team members, are not also uh, able to do. So uh, I do appreciate that. And um, uh, if uh, you or other board members want uh, more information about uh, more specific information about how we're doing that, I'd be happy to talk with Billy Treese and uh, about what other kinds of information we can provide for you about that. Any other comments or questions regarding David's uh, executive director report? My only question, David, was just, you know, how have things been going with the, the holds? Is that operating as expected? Any surprises from the staff that, you know, should, should affect our thinking about the phased approach? Uh, I'm sorry, your question specifically, Sarah, was about uh, people placing holds and picking up materials? Is that what Yeah, the current kind of where you are in the phase path, is there anything about how that is going that would make you feel differently about maybe informing our, our process moving forward? Uh, actually, uh, I ask the question every day and the information I'm getting from staff, especially management and leadership team members, is that that process is going quite well. Um, more smoothly perhaps than even the staff anticipated. Um, now, as more of our community learn about uh, the ability now to either check out or return materials, um, we'll, we'll be carefully watching volume and activity uh, and making sure that we, can, that we continue to manage it. But so far, after more than a week, what I'm hearing from staff is that the process is going actually quite well, which I think is part of that reason is that we took so much careful time to plan and think about how we wanted to do this before we actually started doing it. Yeah, I, I'll say I, I have checked in with David regularly about how things are going with this over the last few weeks and how staff has been asked him how staff has been feeling. Uh, I don't know how active any el anyone else is on Twitter, um, but there's a very vocal and active library community on Twitter uh, that the range of approaches of organizations to reopening has been everything from us to just how soon can we open our doors to everything. 
and there are staff uh, people, um, librarians and frontline staff across the country who are incredibly stressed out about this concern. And I've, and I've talked to David about this before, and I feel like based off what I'm seeing from other places, uh, we, have, we have had a very good measured conservative approach and focusing on safety of our staff and the public in our approach. So I feel I feel like we're in a good place, uh, and and David's uh, team and his work and their work in communicating with others and getting information has uh, served us in the community well, in my opinion. Thank you, Matt. All right, uh, we'll move on. Any. Uh, I think, Dave, was there anything particular about the digital, oh, yeah, the digital library during COVID special report? Yeah, so this is the uh, third month now that we're presenting this special report of our digital and virtual services. And again, I, I hope you can see not only uh, how our community is responding to the services that we're providing and what they're telling us about their engagement with those services, uh, but also the creative ways uh, that our staff uh, have uh, been providing uh, a lot of uh, virtual, uh, including in real time opportunities for our community members uh, to engage. Um, and that includes not only what you often think of, I think, as some of the more traditional uh, library programs, uh, but also uh, the ways that our, our social services team has been able to continue to work and engage with the community. Um, and uh, just how, how creative and uh, how, um, uh, just how, how wonderful the staff has been about pivoting to uh, an environment that, you know, a few months ago, none of us ever thought we would ever really find ourselves working in almost exclusively. Um, but again, um, I've got several members of the leadership team on the call as really uh, as uh, including a couple of members of the management team i think such as mallory and sarah yale so if you have some specific things you'd like to talk about or specific questions about programs um, that i can't answer i can i can always call on one of them to uh to chime in as well um i i had a couple of things uh i had three things so um one, I just wanted to note that you've got a one third open rate on emails, which I think is amazing. <laughs> like, you know, that seems like a very high rate for people opening emails from a large institution. So, um, so that's great that people clearly find uh, a surprising amount of value that they're willing to do that. Um, the uh, second thing I, the, the second thing I wanted to ask about um, so I have two of my conferences, uh, my conventions that I typically go to this over the course of the year did virtual conventions instead. Um, so I got to see um, and they, of course, had to like hustle like mad and it only sort of worked and blah, blah, blah. But there were some things that worked really well. And uh, thinking ahead to the fall um, and and the sort of larger village issues, et cetera. You know, one thing that the library has always done during election season is partner with the League of Women Voters to host the candidate forums. And um, that seems like a really super important part of, um, you know, our civic discourse. And I, I was just going to, I wanted to put it on your radar to think ahead and, you know, as you're maybe attending ALA virtually and seeing how they do things, think about um, are there ways that we can take things like that League of Women Voters Forum and, or, um, or, or other things to a virtual conference sort of setting. And um, that, that was the main one that jumped to mind. Um, for example, like in, in one of the conventions I went to, they had breakout, they had a Zoom, they had Zoom and they, you'd go to attend the panel, there would be a monitored sort of Discord server where people who were attending could talk to each other and chat with each other during 
the panel and there was also a facilitator watching that to send questions and I was surprised by how much it actually added to the panel attending experience to be able to have that other level of conversation with the other attendees um, and then you know another thing that they did was that they had in between sessions they had these um, this big set of breakout rooms in the zoom that were things like by the pottered plant and at the conservatory and so on right and they made everyone a co-host who was registered to attend so that you could join and then go to you know you'd see who was in each room you could go hang out with your friends essentially so it made it possible to have a much more social you know as if you were attending a convention and like talking in the hallways kind of experience than i anticipated so um just, I, I guess I wanted to put that all on your radar for thinking about in the next few months um, as, as possible additions. And then my third question is just about, I'm guessing we don't have this demographic data, um, but I wonder about, you know, seeing the numbers on like how many people open, you know, are using the Facebook or YouTube or um, Twitter is great. Um, I wish we had demographic info on what ages are using which of those services. Um, and because in my experience, it's very age dependent, right? Facebook is mostly 40 somethings, right? And, you know, Twitter is a different, somewhat different age demographic. And, you know, my daughter is on TikTok and, um, you know, the teens are on YouTube and the, you know, et cetera. So, um, I don't know. I, I, I mostly just wanted to raise the, the issue, like, because I'm looking at the, all those things. I'm thinking like, oh, you know, my 13 year old doesn't use any of these. I mean, she uses YouTube a little bit, but, but, you know, she's on TikTok all the time. And um, I was talking to another group of people recently, and they're all on Twitch, um, which is, you know, used for video game reviews, but also it's being used for book reviews now, which I had not even heard of, but apparently it's a big thing. So I don't know. I'm sorry. I'm feeling very old. I'm almost 50, but um, so I don't have any answers here. <laughs> but I wanted to just kind of like put that out there that at some point it would be great to be able to gather demographic age info on the various um, social media uh, as we're moving towards you know, even with reopening, continuing to offer more of this expanded virtual programming. So none of this needs to be done now. Just wanted to like put it all out there. No, thanks, Marianne. Um, well, I, first of all, I can certainly uh, have a chat with uh, Jody and Mallory and find out just how, uh, how possible or accessible that kind of data or information would be and how we might get it and how we might use it. Um, so I can, I'd be happy to have that conversation and, and figure that out. I think it's a great idea uh, to, uh, for instance, approach the League of Women Voters and uh, have a conversation with them about whether they would want to collaborate on a, on a virtual candidate forum later this year. Uh, I think we've, uh, we've gotten more and more comfortable with using platforms like these. And uh, I think it would be certainly uh, easy enough for us uh, to work with another agency to host a, a larger event like that. Um, just seeing how the Institute, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the Luna Jimenez Institute for Social Transformation used the platform for our staff day uh, last week or the week before, mm -hmm. um, just showed me that there's a lot of possibilities there. So um, yeah, we'd be happy to, to have that conversation with them or, or any group that wanted to move up uh, an event like that that would typically happen in person to a to a virtual environment. I think our our environment is the is the great a perfect place for something like that to happen. David, I had a question about um, the hoopla cost, um, and I. Sorry, I clicked away from it. Let me see. Um, oh, the, so yes, the, the hoopla cost seems to have like um, more than doubled since January. And I was just curious if that was because it was the most used one or if we're charged differently uh, for hoopla. 
Well, I, uh, I do think that it is certainly one of the heaviest used services that we have. Um, I know Jeremy is on the phone and or on the call, and maybe he uh, would, uh, wouldn't mind jumping on and, and answering the question a little more specifically. Uh, Jeremy, if you're there. Oh, Sorry, I'm muting. Um, yeah, those are uh, Hoopla and Canopy are per use cost. So with the increased use, then um, they are direct costs added to that. If, uh, it is noted down in the in the uh, financial report too. Uh, let me get that down there. Um, so Hoopla cost was about. It's actually a little less than it was last month. 17,265, and that is almost um, just about double of what it was in February, January. And that ties in with what we're talking about, um, increasing the uh, resources put into the digital content. Uh, Canopy is about double as well. Uh, so I think it is just a relative uh, cost per use between Hoopla and Canopy. We did increase overdrive as well. Um, but that is not cost per use, if I understand correctly. Thank you. And um, how do you see that impact in the budget, I guess, the rest of the year? I know it's something we're going to have to monitor, especially as we reopen, but I'm just curious here. They are keeping an eye on I was talking with Barbara, and she's the one who, who handles all this. Um, and there, she's going to keep an eye on that and make adjustments as we, you know, as we go. Um, I think a lot of the funds are being reallocated to that. So I don't think we're gonna be overspent is my guess that it's gonna balance out um, because there's fewer items coming in physical. Um, so those funds are just being reallocated into digital. But it's something that we'll keep an eye on. But I think this month we're actually in pretty good shape. Um, okay. Thank you. Sorry that I keep bringing it up, but I just want to make sure at least it stays on my mind and all our, all our radars. So that's all. Yeah, we'll keep an eye on it. We'll keep that going through however long we need to here. No, thanks, Christian. Any other questions or comments? I had one thing, the, the, uh, the website user um, numbers on page 22, the drop off in April and May, do we think, I mean, I don't know, is that people like once they figured out how to get into, in like in March, they figured out how to get into the various services and then started kind of jumping to them and bypassing our, our, our site or because the other, the other numbers didn't seem to have a, a similar drop over the months, but it, like after, after March, you know, the, like the, the overdrive, I mean, they, we saw really big numbers in April for all of the services but we saw a drop in our website traffic. It seems like a unique um, it initiated session. So do, do we think that people jumped right to like Hoopla and Canopy and kind of bypassed our site to get there? Yeah, I think I'll let, uh, I'll ask Jody to jump on, but I do think that's, uh, I do think that's true that uh, at some point people could, uh, could just pivot right to the service that they wanted and bypass the, the website entirely. And I think Jody, one thing Jody will probably say when she jumps on here is that uh, um, most of the people who under normal circumstances would go to our website, would visit our website, do so to access the catalog. And since uh, no one was able to, the, since there was no point in using the catalog, uh, that uh, those hits to the website would also drop considerably as well, I think. Uh, Jody, are you on the call? I think you are. I'm so sorry. Of course, my dog is barking right at this moment. Don't worry. Uh, Rudy's going to go get him. Yes, to both, to both points. And number one, once you 
it get set up on Hoopla, Canopy, Overdrive, Use Libby, um, Flipster, any of those um, digital library resources, you're going to go through the app. You're not going to need to go to the website. Um, and the second one being, you know, we yes, we've seen great great um, use of the digital library, but I mean, the numbers are clearly disproportionate. I mean, you just most people go to the library website to go to the catalog to get print materials. So if we're not circulating print materials in April and most of May, then um, people aren't going to the website for the number one reason. So yes, both to both points, David. Thank you, Jody. That's much more interesting. I thought you were just going to say when the weather got better. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, that too. No, I'm just I'm kidding. Was there anything else, Matt? No. There was no, uh, so there was nothing else I particularly wanted to point out from the special report. Um, so unless there aren't any other questions, uh, you could probably move on. I had no I had nothing else. I think we can move on. Are there any questions regarding the disbursements resolution? Uh, is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Moved by Sarah, seconded by Ted. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, we'll call the question. Will the secretary call the roll? Colleen Burns. Aye. Mary Ann Monrash. Aye. Christian Harris. Aye. Virginia Bloomshire. Aye. Ted Foss. Aye. Matt Firth. Aye. Sarah Glavin is also an aye. Does anyone have any questions beginning on page 38 for our financial reports? Um, just, sorry, uh, one quick question. Uh, there's a section where the breakdown is for compensation and talent development. Sorry, I don't have the, I didn't write down the page. Um, I was just curious, does talent development mean, you know, um, staff doing tutorials. I mean, I'm generally in favor of talent development. I just <laughs> just wanted to be sure I understood what it was. That's uh, talent development is what we what we typically call uh, professional development. Okay. So any opportunities for staff for learning, for professional development, for continuing education, uh, that's what we're calling that. Okay, thank you. I had one question at the bottom of page 39. Uh, we saw the, we see the cost breakdown for the th three main digital services. And there was, if I remember overdrive, was overdrive by use, charged by use or not? Cause I'm just trying to figure out why that, the, that price that, that jumped by a third um, is that related to like their, the caps that they, they lifted for us or some other reason? I'm just, cause I know the canopy and hoopla were by use. I'm just trying to figure out why the overdrive jumped so much. Um, I'm going to ask Jeremy again, but I, I believe it has something to do with, uh, increases in, uh, amounts of materials, uh, uh, purchased and, uh, the ability to access more materials. But am I understanding that correctly, Jeremy? 
or Elizabeth? I, th I think you're correct on that. I think it is uh, adding to the collection there. Right. Um, because those are not cost per use, but additional copies. Um, so people don't have to wait on holds and things like that. Right. So because people were not able to, uh, obviously, to get physical materials, but we wanted to make as many, and the consortium wanted to make as many digital materials available as possible. Uh, there were increases in the in the uh, amounts of those materials and and the numbers of copies. Does that make sense, Matt? Yes, it does. I I thought that might be what it was, but I just wanted to make sure. I sure. just want to add on the on the bottom of page um, fifty three over to fifty four, you'll see the library materials. And to Christian's point earlier, the print materials were running about in, in this period. Uh, about the 42% of the calendar year, the fiscal year expended. And you'll see print materials at 13%, audio visual at 14%, 15%, um, digital and streaming content at um, near 60%. So it is balancing out the overall total materials there at 29% at is still uh, well below budget. So you'll see some of that uh, moving to, to digital, but um, it is balancing out within that group. Any other questions regarding our financial reports? Rolling through our summaries and bank statements. Hearing no other questions or comments, we'll move on to um, additional reports, iGov. Marianne, did you go on Saturday? I was traveling, so I was not able to attend. Okay. Um, Council of Governments. Uh, it's still, they have spaced out the, the video conference. Um, instead of every week now to every other week, we will be, it looks like we're skipping the next several though, to kind of let everyone get their feet under them for the various stages of reopening for the park districts and the, and the libraries. But it's been much the same of kind of just checking in where everybody is in terms of uh, managing public events, uh, service, uh, inclusions and stuff like that. So I feel like it's, it's a good, it's been, it's continues to be a worthwhile um, COG meetings, probably I would say uh, some of the more interesting discussions, even though it's still just a lot of information and all, there's not a lot of dialogue, but it's, I think more enlightening than we've, and the ones where it's just Oak Park, it's still members of River Forest and Forest Park joining um, to share what they're doing. Uh, ILA Legislative and Advocacy. Um, it was a very uh, brief meeting this month uh, without much just because of the, the changeovers in, in the um, ILA leadership um, that's, that's taking place. Kind of just uh, a number of members are stepping away from their terms are ending and are gonna be stepping off of the the committee, so there wasn't a lot of new business, just kind of a little talk of what was happening with the legislative session um, in Springfield in that whirlwind of a uh, few days. And it looks like um, per capita grants were in a very good spot um, considering everything else that was going on. Uh, we'll see how that ends up being distributed because in some years where they have done that, um, a fuller initial funding, what ends up coming out has not been as much for a variety of reasons. So we'll see what happens eventually. But uh, right now, ILA is pretty happy with what uh, came out of Springfield. And 
Friends? Friends had their annual meeting and regular meeting last week. Uh, as those of you who've probably seen uh, updates on the website may have confirmed that they will not be hosting the 2020 book fair um, with you know some disappointment amongst the members. There has been ongoing talk and, and kind of revisited talk of them um, putting together a committee for fundraising, but no action was taken at the meeting. I've reached out personally just to offer support if that's something they want to discuss. I think there is a willingness within some of the members, some um, probably less so, <laughs> um, not combative, just a, I think a general um, comfort level with the way they've been operating. And some of the newer members, and I think folks, frankly, that have good insight into the financial dynamic uh, are being a little more realistic that they need to start considering new sources of funding if they want to continue to support some of the efforts that they want to stay behind at the library. Um, there was an appeal for new board members. Um, as I'm sure you guys aren't surprised by, there's not a lot of new engagement. Um, one new member was was voted on during the annual meeting, um, but there was kind of an appeal for those who were kind of there participating, most of whom were active volunteers for the book sale, um, shelvers, sorters, etc. cetera, uh, but no one kind of spoke up or answered the cry. Um, so, you know, I think as, as David and the team continue to support the efforts to ensure, you know, from a budgetary standpoint, we have awareness of how these uh, shortcomings can impact our, our you know, programs and give, uh, frankly, different resources or more limited resources to uh, the staff. Uh, I think, you know, Christian, I know you had offered to kind of raise your hand to potentially be part of some dialogue. I mean, there's a demand and a real need for uh, not just uh, some new thought leadership, but I think very clearly diversity uh, within the ranks of uh, the Friends team. So uh, it sounds like they're very motivated to bring in new people. It's just uh, they're not doing much to make it happen right now. Um, so more to come, but I think it's something as we move into the budget time period, we need to be aware of um, and, and be you know, honest with David and team about implications of you know, some shortcomings from their donations and maybe ways that uh, we might be able to suggest some, some options. Uh, so there, there's a lot of learning, a lot of opportunities. So the uh, only other thing to share, um, it was that there were some pieces of guidance around individuals in the community that might be interested in making donations. Jody, thank you for taking the time to get the website updated. I know there was some commentary on uh, email earlier today about um, some maybe uh, small edits, but if you hear from community members around understanding that folks are disappointed that the book sale won't take place, um, we did make some suggestions for people to be able to consider donations of their books to other community organizations because as David and team will tell you, we do not have space at the library and we don't want to encourage people to drop things off, um, further compounding uh, staff difficulties during COVID and, and kind of dealing with that excess. So if you hear from community members about it, um, Jody has included a list on the, the website. So please refer folks to other community organizations who would be very happy to take books off of folks. Names. So that's it. Anything I missed, David? Oh, thank you, Sarah. That was great. All right, if there's, uh, okay, uh, Jody sent a message in the chat about uh, the website where people can find alternate places to donate. Uh, so we will, if there's no other questions about those additional reports, we will move on to new business, the Intergovernmental Agreement for the Youth Interventionist Program. So that's presented uh, for uh, a vote for your approval tonight, uh, if you're ready to, if you feel ready to do that. Does anyone have any dis, uh, comments, any questions they want to talk about, issues, concerns regarding this? Okay. There, well, is there a motion to approve the uh, agreement as presented to in the packet? So moved. Moved by Ted. Is there a second? Second. Uh, Virginia seconds. 
Any further discussion? All right, will the secretary take the roll, please? Colleen Burns? Aye. Marianne Monraj? Marianne? Oh, are you muted? Uh, I was, uh, I said aye. Oh, sorry. Okay, sorry. Christ Christian Harris? Aye. Virginia Bloomshire? Aye. Ted Foss? Aye. Matt Fruth? Aye. Sarah Glavin, aye. Excellent. Thank you, everyone. Uh, moving on to our non-resident library card resolution. As you know, this uh, is an annual resolution, annual consideration, annual requirement to, to make a decision about whether to participate in the program and to issue non-resident cards. And as a part of that, every year we're required to recalculate uh, what the cost of a non-resident card would be. And Jeremy has done that for you in this memo, uh, just as he did last year. Um, so you can see what, uh, how that calculation is made, what it's based on, and what uh, some of the historic rates uh, have been. Um, just as a reminder, uh, we do not ever sell non-resident cards. No one needs to purchase one from us because no one uh, around us is uh, in uh, any substantial unserved area. In other words, uh, the people who reside in all of the communities and areas around us are all in communities where people already receive library services. So I do not think that we have sold uh, any single card, but uh, there's still a requirement that we establish a, a rate and that we every year decide if we're gonna continue to do it and if we're gonna continue to sell cards if we're asked. So that's why this is presented again for your adoption for tonight. Any questions or discussion? I, I do find that it's a very useful figure to bring to the citizens of Oak Park to say, this is, this is what it's costing you as a household to use the library, use the library. Excellent point. Any other comments or questions? Hearing none. Uh, is there a motion to approve? So moved. Moved by Ted. Is there a second? Seconded. Seconded by Sarah. Uh, if there's no further discussion, the, will the secretary call the roll, please? Colleen Burns. Did I hear Colleen? Aye. Marianne Monraj? Aye. Christian Harris? Aye. Virginia Bloomshire? Aye. Ted Foss? Aye. Matt Fruth? Aye. Sarah Glavin? Aye. Great, thank you. Okay. Moving on to our um, 8C investment of uh, public funds policy. So this and, uh, and the next item on the agenda are uh, proposed revisions uh, to two of our financial policies, investment of public funds and fund balance. Uh, the last time that there were any uh, revisions of these policies made was about 15 years ago and uh, a good uh, number of provisions and, and um, regulations have changed <laughs> in those years. Uh, and Jeremy did a, a great job of investigating what those uh, should be, uh, conferring with um, people at our, our, our auditing firm about them and, uh, and using other uh, sources of information at, his, at hand. Um, and he's on the call and I'll ask him just to, uh, again, summarize what those changes were. 
I know he provided all of you uh, after the board packet went out with uh, copies of the uh, of the actual tracked changes that were made so that you could see what they were. Um, so in addition to him sort of just summarizing, he can answer some additional questions as well. So Jeremy, would you do that, please? Uh, the investment of public fund policy, most of that is the same. Uh, some of the language was, was uh, adjusted a little bit. I think it was a little unclear as far as who was designated chief investment officer, whether it was staff, David, myself, or uh, the treasurer, Kirsten. Um, so I think that, um, that hopefully we cleared up in the responsibilities and delegation of authority. Most of these sections, the prudent person rule, are required by uh, Illinois State Code uh, objectives, things like that. That's all, most of that's directly out of the state. One thing here that we did adjust on some of the guidelines for an investment policy, the majority of our funds are held in uh, the Illinois funds. It's the, this language is directly off the treasurer's website um, of the treasurer's investment pool. And so that, the, the state treasurer does that. Um, so that comment is directly from there. And that's where most of our funds are. We had some adjustments on uh, FDIC, there were a couple of um, insurance groups that had merged in 2000, I think it was 2006. So we just cleaned that up a little, a little bit and uh, to clarify where our funds are placed. Um, and then reporting that, I think most of that was the same. Uh, the last item on their case, sustainable investing, that is new. That was implemented this year, and that was required to for us to integrate that language into our investment policy. So that's really what spurred a lot of this. Is that we had to figure out what to what to say in there and how to make it, you know, integrated into our policy. So that's the majority of it on the investment. Uh, the fund balance policy was uh, most of this was just language and um, to clarify uh, the difference between unappropriated, which you know, in my view is a bit of a misnomer, it's not technically wrong, but um, unassigned fund balance is more appropriate as far as GASI and things like that. So um, I think I had uh, noted in there specific, I think it was GASI 54, where it talks about unassigned fund balance, it defines it. And so that's what we wanted to do is really align the fund balance policy with the right language, but then also clarify some of the, the, the issues of uh, the unassigned fund balance at the fiscal year end. There was no date designated. And when we discussed it last year during the budget, we talked a little bit about that, um, trying to maintain 40 to 48 percent to carry us through periods where maybe the um, tax appropriation or tax distribution was delayed. And so we wanted to make sure we maintain that same level. Uh, and then the other thing that was adjusted was um, the, uh, I'm trying to think of where it was, set it to where we basically have, try and have three months balance in there. Most of the numbers there are stayed, stayed the same. It was just a little bit of language and clarifying that. All right, thanks, Jeremy. Um, so Matt, uh, if uh, you or other trustees have more questions about the changes that Jeremy's proposing, that we're proposing, uh, he's here to answer them. Uh, otherwise, both of these revisions are presented uh, for your adoption for tonight if the board feels uh, prepared to do that. Is there any questions, comments, concerns from anyone? I don't have any myself. Um, see, uh, Christian's on mute. I just want to make sure, Christian, you don't have anything. Uh, thanks, Matt. 
Um, I will admit I actually did not get a chance to look at Jeremy's second email. Um, and I realize now what it was, it was track, probably tracking the changes. Um, I had just glanced at it. So that, that's my own, that's really, I guess, probably the reason I don't have any comments. I don't remember, I didn't actually okay. see what had changed. The, I did read the policies as they were in the packet though, and it, um, they seemed fine to me, nothing in there, you know, and Jeremy's explanation just now seemed, seemed valid. So I'm, I'm fine to move forward. Okay. The only other one, that, the one thing that I mentioned earlier, the change um, was in the investment policy on uh, item two, liquidity. Uh, we did change that from a current month plus one month to current month plus three months to give us a little more wiggle room to make sure that we are liquid and we can pull funds as we need it, at least for a quarter. All right. Is there a motion to approve the uh, this is this will be for the investment uh, policy. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Ted. Uh, will the secretary take the roll call, please? Colleen Burns. Aye. Marianne Monraj. Aye. Christian Harris. Aye. Virginia Bloomshire. Aye. Ted Foss. Aye. Matt Firth. Aye. Sarah Glavin, aye. All right. Thank you. That is approved. Then we have our fund balance policy, which we'll see the I don't know, David or Jeremy, if you want to have any specific uh, fun comments about that. I, I think that, uh, again, Jeremy, I think pretty well covered the, the changes that were proposed. Um, so again, um, unless there are any additional questions, uh, if there are, I'm Jeremy, I'd be happy to answer them. Any questions from anyone? Okay, hearing none. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. I had Colleen making the motion. I think. I think it, she did. Her, her her unmuting did not uh, catch her in time, but I saw I saw the mouth moving. So I'll, I'll assume that Teddy. I will give you the credit for the second. I will do it. I will second it. Thank you, Colleen. If there is no further questions. We will take the roll. Colleen Burns. Aye. Mary Ann Monroe. Aye. Christian Harris. Aye. Virginia Bloomshire. Aye. Ted Foss. Aye. Matt Firth. Aye. Sarah Glavin. Aye. That, and we are approved. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. So last item in new business is a 2020 special meeting for strategic planning. So I uh, put this on the agenda just to have uh, perhaps a brief discussion, uh, brought this up just a little bit uh, earlier in the meeting today, uh, particularly when uh, Marianne was asking about the uh, some ongoing conversations around the master facilities plan process. Um, I certainly think that that would be uh, the ideal time during uh, that special meeting that you have each year to, to uh, re-engage that part of the conversation. I would also like, as I said, to, I think it would be a great idea to set aside some significant time on that day as well to spend with Rashida Graham Washington. I know she's eager to uh, continue a conversation with the board about uh, the library's anti-racism journey and how uh, the board uh, fits in to, to that work. 
Um, so I'd, I'd like us to seriously consider setting aside some good amount of time for that as well. Um, and then of course, I'd, I'd want to hear what uh, the rest of uh, the trustees think about other important uh, topics for discussion on that day, uh, including uh, anything that would inform our, uh, our budgeting process for, for next fiscal year, which uh, as you know, uh, if we, if we uh, mirror our process uh, this year uh, to other years, you know, we begin in earnest uh, looking at uh, uh, information and proposed drafts of various parts of that budget uh, beginning around uh, the month of August uh, and then into September and October. Um, so what I'd like to do again, I'd, I'd like to hear what you have to uh, say about uh, what you would like your special meeting for strategic planning to look like this year. And then uh, a little bit later, perhaps this week, I'd like to follow up with, uh, with an email to all of you to, um, uh, to begin thinking about when you'd like to have that meeting. And uh, again, whether you would like to try to uh, do it the way we're doing this, which is virtually or some other way. Uh, and then of course, if we're going to include Rashida, I'll need to um, check with her about her schedule and, uh, and making sure that she would be available for uh, whatever date you or dates you propose. So um, I will stop talking now and let you talk. <laughs> I don't have a lot to add, but I just, uh, I, I, I know I brought up the facilities planning, et cetera, um, but I wanna take a moment to acknowledge that it is a, it's been a tremendous amount of work for, for me at UIC adapting to online teaching. I mean, it is, normally we would get a course release the semester before to give us time to learn how to take our classes on a, a course online and so, um, I want us to be um, cognizant of not overloading staff uh, with, you know, like given that we're going to be in a state of flux for some time to come. Um, so I, I, I'm going to kind of rely on, I think we should rely on you, David, to like tell us if we're asking too much of staff, right? Like if you're like, no, 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 we are really like still swamped with moving things virtually or, or whatever it is. So um, you know, because the facilities planning, as much as I would like to see it done before my tenure is is up on the board, it is something that can wait. So um. I, I thank you. I, I, I appreciate that both, Mary Ann, from the point of view of of making sure that we have the the human resources capacity to to continue to do all the work, uh, but also because I do think that um, when when we talk about that uh, during our our meeting. Um, I think uh, what, what, what I'm learning, what we're learning is that this environment of ours um, hasn't just changed dramatically over these last few months, but I think uh, has and will continue to change fundamentally perhaps uh, for uh, some good deal of time into the future. Uh, and I think that um, not only us, but the entire, the entire profession is beginning to think about what our physical spaces really do look like and need to look like, and uh, just uh, what kind of priority uh, thinking about physical spaces is now, now should take as we continue to think about the need to provide people with alternatives to physical spaces as well. Um, so I, I definitely think it's a conversation we need to continue to have, but I, I, I dare say that it may not necessarily be or perhaps should be the same conversation mm -hmm. that we're having just a few months ago about physical spaces and what, and what we need those physical spaces for. So I, I appreciate your thoughts on that. Thank you. I think for me, I think at, at least a brief uh, part of it, it would be, I would like to hear from staff as to what they see as the future of virtual programming, uh, as, as an ongoing uh, feature of what we do, um, even as we look down the road towards, you know, fully reopening what, what continued virtual, uh, you know, videos and other you know, virtual meetings and discussions will we continue to build into our 
service structure uh, for the community. Uh, yeah. I think I think that's no. I think that's absolutely right, Matt. I think we have to, and I think that uh, our staff is just has learned a tremendous amount uh, just in these last few months about uh, what not only what it takes to provide services in this kind of an environment, virtual and digital services, uh, but also learning a lot about how the community is responding to that, how they're using it, how they need and want to use it. And again, I, I think that it is, it is going to change um, not only temporarily, but fundamentally how we really think about how we provide services and how we might need to allocate resources in the future differently uh, based on what we're learning about that. So yes, I think we, we definitely need to uh, hear from staff about that and, and talk about that. Um, David, um, I do think that we need a separate, um, or I, I do think that we need another strategy session with Rashida. I just think it's too big and too large of an issue to also combine with our yearly strategy session. So I guess my suggestion would be actually that we find a time, whether, it, I don't know if, it, now that I'm thinking about it, we might, that might be something good to do before we did our yearly strategic plan, but I don't know if we can fit that in. But my suggestion would be that we have one meeting with Rashida kind of on the topic of anti-racism and racial bias um, within the library kind of at the board level. And then we also have our strategy um, meeting as well. And then the uh, other thing is um, around some of the calls to change the um, policing within Oak Park and what that might look like in the future. I'd be very curious to get um, Rob, uh, Stevens, and some of the other staff's thoughts on how the library can potentially be a part of that solution. If there is a potential, some shift in resources or change in the way public safety is looked at in Oak Park. Um, how, how we fit into that. Thanks, Christian. De uh, yes, definitely hearing that. And uh, I think that we can, uh, I think it's fair that we should probably think about having a separate meeting with Rashida because I think it's important enough to devote some significant time just to, uh, just to her work with us. So uh, if the rest of the board agrees, I'll, uh, I'll speak with Rashida first about some, uh, some time that she has available um, and, and, and with all of you. Um, and uh, I'll you know, rely on you to tell me whether, um, I, well, I'm assuming that that meeting is going to be virtual if it's sooner rather than later. And Rashida is perfectly comfortable working uh, through a lot of this in a virtual environment. Uh, many, uh, most of the meetings, perhaps all of the meetings that she's going to have, for instance, with the leadership team coming up are all going to be virtual. So uh, since it is, uh, perhaps we can, uh, maybe that will help be a little bit more flexible about timing, but I'll speak with her first about that and then I'll come back to you with some, some, proposed, uh, some proposed times. Uh, and then I'll, I'll do the same thing except separately uh, with all of you to see how and when and where you want to schedule uh, the special meeting for strategic planning. Um, and then, uh, yes, I think that uh, when it comes to our anti-racism journey, the question about how uh, both uh, historically and recently the library organization has chosen to engage uh, our, the use of our local uh, police department uh, is going to come up repeatedly as a, as a topic in discussions among uh, uh, among the advisory groups, certainly, and, and uh, most likely through the Black Affinity Group. Um, and so that, uh, that will definitely be something that I, I will want to, to include as a conversation between you and Rashida as well. Um, and uh, that also, uh, as I'm sure you, you realize, has implications for how we allocate resources um, and how we use, uh, how we strategically use partnerships and collaborations within the community, uh, such as with our, our council and eventual program. Uh, and I think that uh, we can we can figure out how to manage all those conversations. 
David, can I just add one additional topic uh, as we're thinking about the strategic planning session? And I don't know what dialogue is already taking place. So, you know, you can stop me if this is already happening in another forum. But with conversations about, you know, D97 and D200 having to think very thoughtfully about classroom capacity in the fall, um, I think also being able to speak to how we're planning on using physical space if students are you know, potentially not able to go back to a regular classroom environment for a five-day week, understanding across the three buildings that we have facilities, and a lot of it is about providing social distancing opportunities. If there's already dialogue happening in that space, that's fine. I just have been part of a few different discussions about, you know, how do we collaborate across the district to utilize space in the best, you know, way to create access and equity, especially for parents who don't, frankly, have a choice about returning to work in the fall. Um, so just wanted to raise that for kind of strategic conversation if that's not already happening. Uh, thank you for bringing that up. Uh, actually, uh, there is a conversation about that beginning uh, between me and a couple of my colleagues, particularly Carol Kelly at District 97 and Jan Arnold at the Park District. Uh, because both the uh, the elementary school district and the high school district are are thinking now very carefully about how they're going to uh, reopen and uh, and reintroduce uh, instruction in the fall. And uh, so far, what I'm hearing is that um, that will when it comes to the use of both physical and virtual spaces, that will most likely be uh, as as Carol Kelly put it, sort of a hybrid approach. Uh, which means that both will be used, but that that means that they are going to need to have um, access to more spaces than perhaps are currently available just within the facilities of the school system. So uh, I was having a conversation earlier today with Jan Arnold about this, and I actually expect to have some information to share with all of you uh, perhaps as early as next week about how the library might be able to uh, collaborate to provide some additional space resources for, for the school district in the fall. Um, that again, that's gonna require some conversation by the board. It's gonna require some thinking strategically about how we're going to use our own spaces. Uh, but I think there's an opportunity there for us to do something that does speak to uh, both to uh, issues of equity and also that uh, aligns with a lot of our strategic priorities around supporting access to educational resources for everybody. So thanks for bringing that up. Any other comments or topics we want to make sure we uh, have we built some time in for? Okay. Hearing nothing else, uh, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Seconded. Moved and seconded. Not not up for discussion. Uh, will the secretary take the roll? Colleen Burns. Aye. Marianne Monraj. She said aye. Virginia Bloomshire. Aye. Ted Foss. Aye. I'm sorry, did I skip you, Christian? Christian Harris? Aye. <laughs> Matt Firth. Aye. Sarah Glavin, aye. Thank you, David and staff. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. All right, everybody. <laughs>